Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, the purpose of this talk is to highlight all of the big achievements of the reservoirs and fluxes community in 20 minutes. Of course, that's impossible. So I'm going to do my best and really just bring out, um, you know, some of the, the very kind of astounding discoveries of reservoirs and fluxes. And before I start, I want to, um, I want to just uh, uh, pay tribute to the late Eric Howery, who was the founder of the Reservoirs and Fluxes community, and his kind of intellectual vision really brought all of the components together. <laughs> These are the decadal goals of Reservoirs and Fluxes as set out at the beginning of the program. And you can see that um, establishing open access data streams on gases and uh, related activity, the seafloor carbon budget, estimating the net direction and magnitude of, of carbon fluxes in the deep earth, uh, a carbon cycle model, and, and also models in various scales of all of the different components of the deep carbon cycle. And so to address these decadal goals, very early on, uh, two subgroups of reservoirs and fluxes were established. One is the decade group, deep earth carbon degassing, and the remit of this group was to quantify volcanic carbon fluxes and the second group was the DMGC, Diamonds and Mantle Geodynamics of Carbon. And this group uh, uh, brought together observations of diamonds, their elemental and isotopic composition, their inclusions. And that's led to some uh, really uh, amazing discoveries, which I'll show you in a moment. So first, let's talk about uh, the challenge that faced the decade group in trying to quantify the global volcanic carbon flux, which is a daunting task. Now, CO2 is difficult because there's so much in the atmosphere, so satellites can't see it comprehensively from space. Whereas SO2, we have very good satellite-based records of SO2 reaching now for the past few decades. And so what it was realized fairly early on when you rank these volcanoes emitting SO2 is that there are a lot of volcanoes emitting small amounts of SO2 and just relatively few that emit very large fluxes of SO2. And so suddenly the, the problem becomes tractable in that if you identify the 25 most prodigiously outgassing volcanoes on Earth, then you have a pretty good chance of coming up with a good estimate of the volcanic carbon budget. With the caveat, of course, that the big SO2 emitters might not be the same volcanoes that also emit large fluxes of CO2. And it turns out that is actually the case, which I'll show you. Now, in order to instrument all of these volcanoes and characterize them for their CO2 flux, it was necessary to develop a, an instrumentation and strategy to do so. And that was largely based on uh, this, uh, these uh, spectrometer systems in the UV for measuring SO2 flux, and then in the infrared and electrochemical sensors to measure the carbon-sulfur ratio in volcanic gases. And this was uh, developed by groups in, in Sweden and uh, INGV. And the combination then of SO2 fluxes and carbon sulfur ratios allowed us to back out the CO2 fluxes for all of these volcanoes. And over the decade, the number of volcanoes that the decade group has characterized for CO2 flux has increased enormously. And this is a, a huge achievement of, of, of the group. Now, these instruments can also be uh, mounted on unmanned aerial vehicles. And over the past few years, this has become a really novel and exciting way to uh, monitor volcanoes and actually assess the carbon dioxide flux of volcanoes that are relatively inaccessible or extremely hazardous. And so there have been multiple expeditions uh, just recently this year to Papua New Guinea, for example, uh, led by Emma Liu, now at UCL. And, and this is expected to continue into the future as a really vibrant and exciting area. Now, the carbon flux from the most active volcanoes on Earth were quantified and they're shown here, and this was reported by Iopa et al. this year in scientific reports. And these are ranked volcano names here. It's not necessary to pay attention to the detail, but these are, uh, this is the, S the top 25 emitters of SO2, and this is the top 25 emitters of CO2. And these are not the same volcanoes on each list. Some are similar, but you can see immediately that actually there are different colors here. And Iopa et al. grouped these volcanoes in terms of uh, their subduction setting or their tectonic setting. And the ones in green are the ones that are sourced in subduction zones with uh, a carbonate poor input. The ones in yellow have lots of carbonate being subducted, and so those are expected to supply lots of CO2 to the atmosphere. And the ones in red are intersecting carbonates in the upper plate. 
And the ones in black, these are intraplate continental rift or uh, other intraplate uh, volcanic settings. And you can see that the, the balance between the, the SO2 and the CO2 emitters is quite different, with the CO2 emitting uh, volcanoes being dominated by these that are intersecting carbonates, but also um, having very large uh, fluxes of carbonates being input into the subduction zones. Now, as always, when you instrument a system very uh, uh, precisely and with lots of instruments, often uh, elements of the behavior of volcanoes surface that you weren't expecting. And one of those uh, aspects is the fact that these carbon sulfur ratios have been observed to increase prior to explosive eruptions. And this is actually first noticed at Stromboli and Etna by Alessandro Iuppa. And during the program was uh, recognized at Villarica, and this is data from Turrialba, uh, from Martin de Moore et al. And you can see the carbon sulfur ratio here increases dramatically before these explosive eruptions. And that raises the possibility of carbon sulfur ratios being used in a very meaningful way as part of monitoring networks and forecasting eruptive activity. A very important outcome of the work of the decade group has been the realization that as well as the active degassing of volcanoes in eruption, the diffuse degassing of CO2 along faults and fractures uh, is as important, if not a little bit more important, for the total, total vol uh, volcanic carbon budget. And so this map up here shows all of the actively degassing volcanoes with uh, CO2 flux in these colors symbols. And this is from Werner et al., the chapter in the, the new Cambridge University Press book that you'll all get a copy of. And here is a map showing all of the diffuse carbon sources. And you can see here I've circled some particularly important regions, uh, intraplate regions largely. This is Yellowstone. This is the East African Rift. And this is Campi Fugre, uh, Solvatara, or in fact, the whole of uh, Italy is an important source of diffuse CO2. And this histogram here shows that uh, this is a CO2 emission rate histogram showing that active degassing volcanoes and diffuse emissions are, are equally as important. Another uh, big task, a daunting task, of the reservoirs and fluxes group in, in general was to think about the carbon flux from the remote and inaccessible regions at the depths of the ocean. And this is a really difficult uh, thing to do, and obviously we can't deploy instrumentation across the entire mid-ocean ridge system of the planet. And so it's necessary to be a bit inventive and a bit creative and use proxies. And so two independent methods have been used to try and estimate the CO2 flux, and this is a map um, from Lavoyer et al., 2018, of the CO2 flux in the mid-ocean ridge system. And they used barium as a proxy for CO2. Barium seems to behave similarly to CO2 during melting in, in the mantle. And so whilst um, glasses or erupted magmas at mid-ocean ridges have degassed most of their CO2, you can use the barium as a, as a, as a proxy uh, for the amount of CO2 that was originally in that melt. And so they used that and came up with a, a range of CO2 uh, for the mid-ocean ridge system. And then an independent method used heavy noble gas systematics uh, this is presented by Tucker et al. Uh, last year in EPSL, and came up with a similar kind of number. So the total volcanic carbon budget then has been quantified, and these are numbers, of course, that will change and be revised and will always um, be improved upon as we get more measurements and as we understand particularly um, how temporarily variable these individual sites are in terms of their carbon flux. But the broad features of this is that... Uh, oops. The broad features, oops, back, 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 back. Ah, ah, sorry, could you go back? Back, 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 back. There, stop, stop, that, that's it, sorry, <laughs> I'll carry on. The broad features of this are that subaerial degassing and diffuse degassing are equally as important, um, and the East African Rift seems to be an important point source. Submarine volcanism has been quantified, and the total amount is somewhere in this kind of range. Uh, and this, again, is presented by Cindy Werner in the, in the carbon chapter in the CUP book. And I just want to point out that anthropogenic fluxes, we think, are around 35,000 teragrams per year, and that's the same as megatons. And so, of course, this is about 100 times that value. So one important result that's come out of all of this analysis um, is that volcanic carbon fluxes are very small compared to anthropogenic fluxes. Now, the next step in this journey was to try and link the volcanic gas composition to the subduction zone model, or to develop a model relating inputs to outputs. 
And one important step in this journey was to realize that the carbon-sulfur ratio of the volcanic gases actually had a relationship with the barium lanthanum ratio or some geochemical in index of the erupted magmas themselves from these arc volcanoes. And so it turns out that the carbon-sulfur ratio is high and the barium lanthanum ratio is high for those uh, volcanoes in highly, uh, with, with lots of carbonate being subducted. And then for, for arcs in green here, where there is very little carbonate being subducted, these are low barium lanthanum uh, magmas. And then there's a subset of volcanoes that emit very carbon-rich gases that are intersecting carbonate from the upper plate. And in fact, this model can then be used to predict, you know, based on this barium lanthanum ratio, for example, and other geochemical indicators, which we have lots of data for, we can then use these models based on observations to actually predict the missing CO2, so the CO2 that we haven't measured at all of these other volcanoes. And another thing we notice from the um, uh, erupted gases in subduction zones is that they have a heavy carbon signature uh, isotopically, and that, in fact, the volcanoes emitting the most carbon have the, the heaviest carbon isotope signatures. And that implies, of course, a role for inorganic carbonate, whether that's subducted carbonate or whether it's carbonate in the overlying slab that's being assimilated. So that's another important part of the model that's starting to be assembled to understand subduction zones. And a recent development in this effort has been this week, published in Nature by Terry Plank and, and Craig Manning in the, in the uh, Nature Collection, which is a, a superb synthesis of what we understand about subduction zones. And we're now in a position, for the first time, I think now, at the end of this program, to say that we understand each of these different components of the system. We understand through ocean drilling what is going down into a subduction zone, the proportions of inorganic carbonate or oxidized carbonate, the proportions of organic carbon-bearing sediments, what sort of carbon is present in the carbonated oceanic crust and mantle, constrained by observations and, and then um, models to, to, to describe that. And then once, once the subducting slab enters the mantle, we, we can now model uh, very well what happens to it. We know the thermal structures of all these subduction zones around the globe. And we can model uh, decarbonation, metamorphic decarbonation. So Craig Manning has just been talking about the devolatilization uh, or dissolution of carbonate in these supercritical fluids that come off the slab and also the melting in very hot subduction zones. And then the outcome for the slab that returns to the mantle. And so these are just a couple of examples taken from the Planck and Manning paper. Uh, Tonga, where there's very little sediment being subducted, this is a relatively cool subduction zone. And so there's relatively inefficient decarbonation of the subducting slab, which means that here most of the carbon is being returned to the mantle. Another example is from Cascadia, which is a particularly hot subduction zone with a lot of reduced carbon or organic uh, carbon in the sediments. And in this case, uh, most of that carbon is removed from the slab. And so what's returned to the mantle is very little in terms of carbon. So all of the carbon gets returned to the atmosphere. Now, I think what comes out of this analysis for me is that these subduction zones are all different. There's probably no one generic model that describes uh, a subduction zone, a general subduction zone. And the other thing that comes out of it is that the total volcanic carbon outgassing budget is roughly equal to what's being returned to the mantle. And so the system is, is roughly in balance. Then we come to diamonds, and that's the other big part of the reservoirs and fluxes community. And this, the diamonds give us information about what happens to that carbon once it's subducted and what we can find out. Now, of course, diamonds, as you know, are stable beneath about 130 kilometers in the mantle. They're found in the subcontinental lithospheric parts of the mantle, but they're also found in the transition zone and the lower mantle, and they can be brought up to the surface. And we heard about these beautiful examples um, from Evan Smith this morning of super deep diamonds. And diamonds and their inclusions are particularly important for telling us about the nature of the deep mantle. They can, they can contain inclusions of mantle lithologies, but also lithologies that tell us the oceanic crust is being subducted deep into the mantle and then being returned to the surface through kimberlite eruptions. And then these super deep diamonds give us information about these high, high pressure assemblages deep in the mantle and often contain tantalizing glimpses uh, that, that material is being subducted. And it's for that reason I'm going to focus on a few of the big discoveries that have come from these, uh, this category of super deep diamonds. They often contain assemblages which suggest that they're remnants, they're formed from remnants of oceanic 
frost and mantle that have been subducted. Uh, they have carbon isotope compositions. You can see a summary of the carbon isotope compositions here. They often have very light carbon isotope signatures, uh, and that could be related to the subduction of organic components that survive on the subducting slab. They've been shown to contain heavy oxygen isotopes consistent with uh, surficial oxygen that have been subducted. And the inclusions are highly enriched in these very incompatible rare earth elements. And so it's uh, assumed that diamond may precipitate from fluids and these kinds of redox freezing reactions that Suki Dorfman told us about this morning where magnesite in melt reacts with carbide to form silicates and diamond. So the inclusions in these super deep diamonds have led to all sorts of exciting discoveries and I'm going to give you just three examples here and we've already heard about this one. These are the diamonds of the type found in, in the crown jewels. These are the clipper diamonds that have been found to contain these metallic iron, nickel, carbon, sulfur inclusions in them. They also have uh, 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 eclogitic uh, high pressure affinities. Uh, they're evidence that the lower mantle is reducing and actually if you go down into the mantle Minerals tend to take up lots of Fe3+, plus, leading to a disproportionation of iron into uh, Fe2+, plus goes to Fe3+, plus and elemental iron. And so that's why this is such an abundant phase uh, in, in the lower mantle, and it also carries lots of carbon, to perhaps up to 6 weight percent carbon. So this could be a really important phase for storing carbon, and it may be a new mechanism that, for, for which diamonds can grow and precipitate in these fluids in the, in the deep mantle. So this is a, um, one of the discoveries. The second one is from diamonds from the Kulinan mine in South Africa, published by Nestola et al. in 2018. And in these diamonds, uh, we found that the, the only finding of a non-reverted calcium silicate perovskite, one of these minerals that's been predicted to be a very important phase in the lower mantle, but it's never been seen in its natural state at the surface of the Earth, only in its retrogressed form. And the diamond itself had heavy carbon isotope composition. And so this discovery has implications, again, for the recycling of oceanic crust and sufficient carbon uh, to lower mantle depths. And then finally, um, the evidence of a water-rich uh, transition zone comes from the observation of hydrous ringwoodite. Ringwoodite is, of course, a high-pressure form of olivine, which is found in the transition zone between 410 and 660 kilometers in the mantle. And this is in that tiny little red square here, this little blue mineral. And using FTIR, Pearson et al. discovered it contained 1.4 weight percent of water. And so this has implications for the nature of the transition zone. It could be that the transition zone is a graveyard for hydro slabs. It could be that this water was there all along. It's primordial water. But it's certainly important for the water budget of the Earth and perhaps also for ascending mantle material in, in mantle plumes. Now, we've heard about the blue and blue diamonds is caused by boron. Boron is, is uh, abundant in the surface, in the, in the seawater. Serpentinized um, oceanic crust contains plenty of boron. The mantle contains very little. So it's been suggested that this boron is actually, again, a remnant of this, of this surface environment transported down to deep. So the overarching theme of all of these discoveries is subduction. It's all part of the subduction cycle. Now, Decade and the DMGC generated enormous amounts of data, volcanic gas data, diamond data, and Kirsten Lennart at uh, Lamont has really spearheaded the effort to collate all of this data and create databases that makes all of this open access and usable by the, the community at large. And so the Decade portal, which is online, and you can see demonstrations of that in the poster session, uh, allows you then to search on gas data from all of these different volcanoes. It's linked to the EarthCAME database. So you can get geochemical data for rocks and melt inclusions at the same time. Um, a huge amount of melt inclusion data has been input to the EarthCAME database, as well as all of these diamonds have been catalogued um, and uh, the samples included in PETDB. So this, amount, this represents an enormous amount of work, and it was one of our core principles in RNF to actually make this happen. And then the last thing I want to talk about is the modeling. And I just want to highlight a couple of uh, recent developments, um, the nature of the whole Earth carbon cycle. Uh, Cinti Lee has published uh, a, a chapter in the Deep Carbon Past to Present book uh, showing the, the deep carbon cycle through time and the implications for uh, the surface carbon reservoir. 
uh, thinking about uh, feedbacks and tipping points and supercontinent rifting and so on. And many of these fluxes, as I've um, talked to you about, have been refined by the decade group, the fluxes of carbon from the mantle and through volcanoes and so on. The other thing that we've looked at is instead of the steady state business as usual carbon cycle, what happens when it's perturbed? When these very large catastrophic perturbations to Earth's carbon cycle occur due to asteroid impacts, large igneous provinces and so on. And so uh, Selena Suarez has headed up this special issue of the Elements uh, magazine to look at that uh, problem and to quantify what these carbon perturbations are. So this would be steady state and this is the magnitude of the perturbations. And notice that anthropogenic emissions there count as a major perturbation to Earth's carbon budget. And then my very last slide is I want to pay tribute to this uh, um, uh, sequence of uh, very important advances that have been made by coupling a plate tectonics reconstruction model uh, led by Dietmar Muller of the University of Sydney and his Earthbike group with paleoclimate models, with geochemical models based on the present day um, deep carbon cycle to understand carbon through deep time. And I think this has absolutely revolutionized the way we think about this kind of modeling. And he's uh, published papers on con the carbon output from continental rifting through time, carbonate accumulation on the sea floor by coupling the plate tectonic reconstruction model with a model of CCD uh, changes over the, the last 200 million years, how magmas intersect with carb uh, platform carbonates in the overlying plate, large igneous province, carbon perturbations to the atmosphere, and many other things. So there's a whole sequence of paper he papers here that I, I recommend uh, that you look at. And then most recently, Wong et al. have tried to synthesize all of these um, products together to, to produce a model of ingassing and outgassing the Earth through the last 200 million years. And that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. <laughs>